my fellow Americans. Not long ago, I received a letter from a woman in the Midwest. She wrote, I have a son who is now in Vietnam. My husband served in World War II. Our country was at war. But now, this time, it's just something that I don't understand. Why? May 1966, and I am somewhere in Bolloy Woods looking for Viet Cong. I'm from San Francisco, I know hills and fog. And now, 95 degree heat, parched white rice patties, and me out here with these APCs, that's armored personnel carriers, and these humongous M48 tanks. How the hell was I so stupid to think I could drop out of school to go travel and not get drafted? <laughs> Mr. Kleinberg, back at Fort Benjamin Harrison, you might have been an information specialist, but over here, you are a combat correspondent. You'll be writing for the division newspaper, the Tropic Lightning News, TLN, and the division magazine. The ambush. And we trust you will enjoy your combat. <laughs> well, I don't know about that combat part, because if I had to use this M14, I'd probably just shoot myself in the foot and take out the first couple of rows here. But I do <laughs> enjoy the tools of the trade. My army issued. Nikon single lens reflex camera? What do you think? That's the right answer. And this cute little eight millimeter movie camera that I brought from home. Not that I've had much of a chance to use this stuff. I've been out four times now and nothing ever happens because nobody is gonna mess with this American <coughs> power. Yeah. I do support the war. I had the same old argument with my best friend, Mike Duba, just before I left. Dave, it's just Lyndon Johnson's war, and he represents the military-industrial complex. It's all about capitalism, money. Mike and I have lived across the street from each other since we were 10 years old. We've gone up to Laguna Honda Schoolyard to play ball year after year. Now Mike has hair down to here. Mike. You look and you smell like a sheep. <laughs> Dave, the Vietnamese have been under foreign domination throughout their history. The Chinese, the French, now the Americans, all they want is their freedom. Mike, communism isn't freedom. The domino theory isn't bullshit. If you and your buddies had just stopped protesting for a week, this war would be over. But the truth is, I'd rather not be here. I mean, I'm 23 years old. I'm way too old for this shit. War is for young people. I can best serve my country as a student. I told Mike that. <laughs> Dave, you have a 1.6 GPA. <laughs> and about the hair, the gals kind of like it. How many times have you gotten late this year? Late? Truth be told, a number much less than my GPA. <laughs> uh, back here in Boloy Woods, and uh, this is exactly what Search and Destroy is all about. See those few thatch huts over there? Our job is to go in there, check them out for signs of VC. So you can see uh, our soldier here is crouched just to be cautious. And there's a couple of his buddies by that APC supporting him. And uh, now they moved into the village and there's a couple of women trying to get this nervous water buffalo under control. Women, children, old men. Fucking flies. 
I hate this heat. Thank God, we're going back to the base camp tonight. Huh. A couple of pops, like popcorn. Uh, Frank, what was that? Frank's McGunner, big husky guy from Alameda. Well, that, my son, was incoming. <laughs> it is September 1997, and I'm at the Holiday Inn in Atlantic City. Our first reunion, 30 years after we left the war. This guy, Doug Kimberly, he got this new thing called the internet. And now we're all back together again. And how nice of the hotel to pump in our music. Well, the sign on the door says it all. Vietnam Public Information Office Reunion. Huh, well, where do they get these pictures? Ha, there's me, Gino, and Doug in the office. Huh. Well, I recognize the people back there on the door, but who the hell are these old fogies? <laughs> Dave! Uh, Doug, Doug, Kimberly, uh, you look great. Well, actually, not that great. Doug looks like he's put on about 30 pounds since he left Vietnam and uh, might have done a little drinking. Back then, he was just this sweet 18-year-old country boy from Illinois who actually volunteered to come to Vietnam to help save my country from communism. I got to do that. Well, Doug, what you been up to? Spent 25 years with the Springfield Police Force. Now I'm working for a private security firm. Oh, well, that's uh, great, but um, you know, I don't see Gino anywhere. Gino isn't coming. Looks like he couldn't make the 30-mile drive from his house. Got a call from his wife a half an hour ago. She said he got in the car three times, came back to the house three times. I guess he still isn't ready to deal with what happened in the bunker that morning. Oh, man, Gene was my closest buddy in Vietnam. We bunked across from each other. We worked on the division newspaper together. Oh, man. But um, 25 of my other good buddies are here. We all sit down to have some drinks before dinner. It's actually kind of weird because um, there's no rank here. Nobody salutes anybody. Everybody just calls each other by their first name. Well, not everybody. Captain Joseph Madfis III, West Point, just sits over there by himself <coughs> drinking. Well, it looks like Muttface still an asshole. <laughs> yeah, Muttface, that's what we called Captain Mattface back then because his face looks like a dog's and, of course, he treated us like dogs. Major Simpson, still our great commander after all these years. He gently lifts a full glass of burgundy. Men, 30 years ago, Colonel Ware, the chief of all Army information, said we were the number one information outfit in the country. Bar none. Colonel Ware was 100% correct, and I was the luckiest commander on the planet to have men like you working for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, thank you, Major Simpson, for setting the tone. Because we have three great days together. We drink, we laugh, we swap war stories and war pictures. We briefly talk about that one horrible morning and then quickly move on. But most of all, we just look at each other. And we vow early on that we will do this again. 
It's the morning of the final day, and just me and Doug remain. Oh my God, Doug, we got to do it, right? Absolutely, Dave, kick it in. The kids in Bristol there, Shark, that's the kids <laughs> only when we do the mic face stuff. Really, something with the door is jumping when we do the mic face stuff. Oh. Yes, we are one singular sensation. <laughs> hey, Doug, Gino wrote those lines. I wish you were here. Well, I'm back in Boloy Woods where I just got shot at and I'm going to write my duba. Huh. A couple more pops. Uh, Frank, where's that coming from? Frank's eyes are fixed on the horizon. His finger moves to the trigger of the 50 caliber machine gun. Coming from that village now, getting the bug, son, right now. So I hop into the APC, and all of a sudden Frank and the rest of us, already accompanied by helicopter gunships, are streaming toward that village. And guess what? I am a combat correspondent. <laughs> And I am bouncing up and down in the APC and Frank's 50 caliber machine gun shells are flying by my face and the smell of cordite is <coughs> choking my chest and that village is on fire. That village is on fire. And suddenly I realize that I am so excited because I understand that all the rockets and bullets are coming from us and going into that village and none are coming our way. And that village is on fire. And as suddenly as it begins, it ceases. We're resting, the, even the helicopter gunships are gone. We're resting on this berm. There's a light breeze and the flies have returned. And people are coming out of the village. Just women and children down this dirt road bisecting the rice paddies. The women are wearing white conical hats, white blouses, and black pajamas. In each hand, they have a bundle that they've grabbed. They walk briskly by us, but not one of them looks in our direction. At the very end, there's a little kid, about 11. He's got a box of American sea rations? Yeah. In his other hand, there's a little boy, probably his brother, about three. Little boy has a mohawk haircut and he's naked from the waist down. And as he passes, he turns his head and looks me directly in the face. And my eight millimeter camera is clicking away. Well, we are back here in the Public Information Office of the 25th Infantry Division here at Kuchi. It's a big office. There are five huge fans whirling 24 hours a day. You, you, and you, you're protecting us. There are 15,000 of you. Infantry units, artillery units, cavalry units. In fact, oh, did you hear that? That was the sound of a 175 millimeter cannon shooting shit out into the jungle. <laughs> Goes on all night sometimes. Hmm. In fact, we are so safe here in the middle of the base camp. If you look through that window there, you can see the bunker by my tent. We don't even need to put a top on it. So here's how things work. Over here, you've got all your officers and their enlisted helpers. And here, you've got your editors your photographers, an artist, and uh, we reporters like me, and my good buddy Gino Caro, who came to America when he was 16. Gino is a great reporter, but for some reason, he wants to become an editor. Of course, 
get the hell out of the field. I'm a graduate of literature from NYU. Well, Gino is also the creator of the information specialist song that we like to sing when old mutt face is out of the office. Like right now. Okay. We are information specialists, and oh, we no cause, no fuss. Because we're non vital to the war effort. Oh, please don't shoot at us. <laughs> Oh, our VC, our VC, listen to our plea. Well, we just set out our typewriters pounding key after key. Well, we like it anyway. <laughs> so I got some stuff I got to do. Like, for instance, I got to mail off this film to mom. And of course, I got to write Mike Duba. Um, Dear Mike, uh, I was shot at today for our country. We were attacked by 30 Viet Cong and my gunner Frank, he got hit so I had to take over the machine gun. Well, you know, of course I really didn't write like that, but if something had happened, I'm sure I could have done something. And uh, of course I didn't tell Mike or anybody in this office about how we just shot up that village for no particular reason and well that night was really hard for me to get to sleep because <clears throat> just kept seeing that little boy's face why must young Americans born into a land exultant with hope and with golden promise, toil and suffer and sometimes die in such a remote and distant place? The answer, like the war itself, is not an easy one. We have learned at a terrible and a brutal cost that retreat does not bring safety and weakness does not bring peace. against my solemn advice, has recommended that you go down to Saigon to edit the division newspaper. Mr. Kleinberg, you best not fuck this up. <laughs> what? After four months of the field getting shot at, I'm going down to Saigon, work off base, work in civilian clothes, not have mud face breathing down my neck. I don't understand it for a single second. I spent three years at the San Francisco Chronicle working part-time as a copy editor while going to school. What the hell is the Army doing putting the right man in the right place? <laughs> yeah, that night at the mess hall, <laughs> I'm going to Saigon. I'm going to Saigon. you stay in the coochie. You'll be staying in the coochie. I'll be the rest. You be get shot. You be get Mr. Kleinberg, just remember, you best not fuck this up. <laughs> Mr. Kleinberg, I told you not to fuck it up. <laughs> what? I've been down in Saigon for three months now. I'm having a ball. And I'm doing a good job putting out the paper. I thought Mudface has pulled me back up to Coochie to put me in for Spec 5 and maybe a medal. <laughs> Mr. Kleinberg, got a call the other night from the commander of the Wolfhound. Seems like the commander of the Wolfhounds gave you a list of 23 of his men that won bronze stars for bravery. Seems like you've killed all 23 of these men. <laughs> in the current issue of the Tropic Lightning News. 
You best look at this! Somehow the word posthumously got on top of this column of medals. Oh, no. oh, no. I know what happened. Previous week we had a whole list of bronze star medal winners, but all those guys had died to earn their medals. We must have forgot to pull the word posthumously from the top of that column. So, Mr. Kleinberg, uh, Major Simpson, in agreement with my solemn advice, has relieved you of your duties and has sentenced you to four weeks of shit burning detail. <laughs> Mr. Kleinberg, you best not fuck this up. Uh. You know, what the hell am I going to do? A day. You're just to do a lousier job. <laughs> you know the army, the more you do, the more you do. The less you do, the less you do. No, 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 my face just wait for me to fuck up, and then he's really going to stick it to me. Okay, then, let me give you some advice. Advice? What the hell do you know about shit burning? I do a one time, no like to talk about. <laughs> uh, two important uh, things. Number one, do not to uh, think about the shit. <laughs> uh, think instead about the uh, nurse Karen down at the 12th of Medivac. She a good a fuck. <laughs> you fucked her? Everybody fucking nurse Karen. <laughs> Second important thing, do not put too much fuel on the ship. Do not <laughs> put too much fuel on the ship. I am the god of hellfire and I bring you fire. I'll take you to burn. Fire. I'll take you to burn. I am standing in front of the administration shit house. It is the biggest crapper on the base. There are 24 cans each, 24 seats each with a can underneath containing 250 pounds of shit, piss, chewing tobacco, and God don't ask what else. My job is to pull out each can and then drag it over here 70 feet to where it's safe to burn. Gino says, just to think about the nurse again. <laughs> oh, nurse again, I'd like to suck on those breasts. Oh, nurse again, I'd like to stick my head where it went more. Oh, the nurse again. Fuck! Now I have shit stew on my jungle fatigues. I hate you, Gino. I hate you, Gino. I hate you, Gino. One down, 23 to go. I am the god of hell. I hate you, dear. I hate you, dear. Oh, there's a camera like the truck of the best. Oh, there's a camera. I hate you, dear. I hate you, dear. Oh, there's a camera like this. Don't worry, I'm not going to do this another 22 times. <laughs> Get the show on the road. <sighs> you know, says, do not to put too much of fuel on the ship. <laughs> well, you know, fuck you, Gino. The more fuel I get on the ship, the faster I'll get my ass out of here. <laughs> now I gotta light that roll of toilet paper on top of the official shit stick. <laughs> Nice the flame. Uh, marshmallows, anybody? <laughs> Do this 23 more times. I stir the shit every 15 minutes, and I'm done. Yeah, I know. But at least I'm not in Boloy Woods. Dear Mike, 
I was wounded in action today. I took some shit shrapnel in the chest. A day to make sure you tell the mic that the, a mutt face are putting you in for a brown the heart. But hey, I do a great job for four weeks and all I'm thinking is free at last, I am shit free at last. <laughs> Mr. Clamber, I must confess you've done a Hall of Fame shit burning performance. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've just been informed that 19 of the parents of the 23 men that you killed somehow got a copy of that paper back home. And they've all been asking their congressmen that if their sons are indeed deceased, why well, nobody has bothered to tell them. Consequently, I'm going to have to order you another four weeks of shit burning detail. <laughs> On the plus side, if you do a fine job, you will be awarded with a fine military medal. And even if you do fuck it up, you will still receive this medal. <laughs> Only posthumously. <laughs> <laughs> so another four weeks just drag on by, uh, but tomorrow is my final day. Yeah, I don't even think I can get up. I'm out of it. A day. I have a friend on a three-quarter cab. He the one to tell me about the nurse's account. He have a small flat to bed a truck I can borrow. We can just uh, load up the ship, drive to the burn spot. Well, that's one hell of a good idea, so we do exactly that the next morning, and old Gino is, is slowly driving toward the burn spot when, uh, what the hell about the black cloud? Hell, there's two million flies coming at us. <laughs> I, I could no uh, see, I could no see. Gino, get the vehicle under control. Uh, I, I could no see, I could no see. Gino, the left! Gino, the left! Uh, I can know a C! And so, the three-quarter ton truck, it tips! <laughs> <laughs> it wavers! And then it plunges into the administration dips, sending 6,000 pounds oh. of shit and piss slowly meandering <laughs> downstream, where it comes to the front of the officer's mess hall. It takes a right turn, and then solidifies like a tapioca pudding lake, right in front of Captain McFace's tent. <laughs> Mr. We are looking for a journalist of outstanding talent to send up to Tain In. Why, we figured you'd be the perfect specimen. <laughs> Tain In? Huh. Well, Operation Attleboro has just started up at Tain In, 25 miles northwest of us. It's shaping up to be the biggest battle of the war. It is now the height of the American buildup. There are 500,000 American soldiers in Vietnam now. And we've heard rumors that our beloved wolfhounds, hundreds of them, are trapped in the jungle. Mudface is trying to get me killed. Why, yes, Major Simpson. Well, actually, uh, Kleinberg's with me right now, sir. Well, that's unfucking believable, sir. Well, if those are your wishes, sir. Uh, Mr. Kleinberg, you prove again to be one fucking lucky soldier. Turn 
turns out all the shit and piss has disappeared. <laughs> and they found a Viet Cong tunnel underneath the officer's mess hall. <laughs> <laughs> Along with 15,000 pounds of enemy rice and a whole shitload of BC weapons. <laughs> Mr. Kleinberg, perhaps we should just erect a bronze statue of you outside the administration office. <laughs> Along with an eternal burning can of shit. <laughs> but uh, now that I am the shit detail hero of Coochie, <laughs> Major Simpson gives me back my job and that's good enough. Even though they order me to come back to Coochie and I once again have to listen to the 175s going off all night long. my country from communism. Well, Doug has been white-eyed since he returned from A.N. <clears throat> two weeks ago. He filed some stories, fierce fighting in the jungle, striking American gains. Exactly the same message the Army has been echoing down in Saigon. Doug, uh, say uh, something. Uh, Doug, uh, please. Dave, Gino, it isn't happening the way the Army says in Saigon. Our wolfhounds are trapped in the jungle. They can't see five feet in front of them. They're surrounded by VC. They're taking heavy casualties. Our own troops can't even help them with air or artillery support. Well, the reason all this has happened is because the commander of the battle, General Edward Desisor, has, as might face might put it, fuck things up. But more so, the army has fucked things up. Once again, putting the wrong man in the wrong place. General Desisser has never led an infantry command in his 32 year military career. So it's no wonder down in Saigon that the media always refers to the nightly press briefings as the five o'clock follies. A day, a down in the Saigon, only a two kind of a battles. The ones we won, and the ones we won. <laughs> this is why the Kong casualties are always a heavy, and American casualties always a light. Uh, dear Mike, things are going great here. Uh, the other day they put up a small basketball court near the three-quarter cab mess hall. I got to a couple of pickup games. It was great. Can you be a mess? Well, you shouldn't have been a mess then. Hey, Gino. Someone else I don't think we're going to be thinking much about head. Operation Dattleboro today. These boots uh, no uh, shit. Uh, those uh, boots gonna walk over me at any uh, time. Well, why, of course we're excited. It's Christmas Eve. 
and Bob Hope and his gals are here to entertain us. And the 8th Artillery shows its appreciation by lobbing lead into the nearby jungle just to remind Charlie that this event is invitation only. <laughs> Bob Hope grabs his classic driver and he takes his signature swing. Hey everybody, so great to be here at Coachie today. This highway patrolman pulls over a speeding limousine. The driver rolls down the window. It's Lyndon Johnson. The highway patrolman says, Oh my God. The president says, You better believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and don't worry everybody, Lyndon Johnson is not going to cut short this USO. <laughs> hey Bobby, I need to get a hold of your keys. Well Nancy, can't you see I'm right in the middle of a joke. But Bob, I need your keys. <laughs> well, okay Nancy, why don't you just reach in my pocket. Okay, Bob. Oh, I feel a little funny. <laughs> uh, well, Nancy, dig a little deeper and you'll feel a little nuts. <laughs> a day. A next a time you have to shift the detail. Uh, maybe you can uh, burn uh, some of these uh, jokes. <laughs> oh my God. Gino, Nancy Sinatra just grabbed Joey Heatherton and Ann Margaret. Those gals are strutting their stuff. And 10,000 GIs go a little nuts. A long time no round eyes. <laughs> hey, everybody, been a great crowd here today at Coochie. Before I leave, I just want to remind you, America's behind you, 18%. Uh, there you go, Mr. No a Hope Above a Hope. Which, uh, remind me, we need to go to the office. A fish a working on the Christmas Eve. Oh yeah, David Fisher just pounded out another battlefield story. Oh yeah, we're going to be going out with the three-quarter cab tomorrow. You're going to get me some VC. <laughs> going to be great. Then I'm going to come back here and finish off the scotch. <laughs> going to get wasted. Hey, what are you guys doing here? A fish. What are you doing here? Christmas Eve. You go to the field more than any of us. You take a more risk than any of us. For what the reason? You have a sweet a wife and a two little boy at home that they love you. But Fishy just keeps pounding away on the typewriter. Uh-oh, Captain Mudface has just come into the tent. A herd of rats go thundering across the corrugated tin roof, depositing puffs of dusk above Fish's head. Specialist Fish! What the hell is that bottle doing underneath your desk? You are one fucking low-life alcoholic. Get your fucking ass out of this office. So Fish, he comes back to our tent, he puts on his helmet and he goes jogging around the administration <laughs> loop. Absolutely naked. <laughs> it was Fish's way of saying, fuck you to the army. And this is why we all love Fish. He's like our little brother that gets beat up by some big bully, but he never gives in. Later that evening, Fish, long gone, asleep in an administration ditch. Just me, Gino, and Doug drinking in the safety of our own tent. 
Uh, even a few bottles of alcohol can't numb the loneliness of being so far from home on Christmas Eve. And the lingering resentment over Operation Adelberg. Gino lifts his fourth margarita to uh, General uh, Dada for sure. Dead? For sure. <laughs> That's exactly what half the base camp is now calling General Desisor. What an asshole. Let's sing it, boys. And to that old holiday standard, oh Christmas tree, <laughs> Gino, of course, has penned some different words. Oh, dead for sure, oh, dead for sure, you're not a general anymore. The wolfhounds died in a jungle cloud. Oh, dead for sure, you can't be proud. Oh, dead for sure, oh, dead for sure, you're not a general anymore. Um, Doug, Gino. I know we lost a lot of wolfhounds in that battle, but we might have taken out the 9th BC Division in the process. And isn't this a little over-the-top disrespect for a commanding officer? Dave, you need to drink a little more. <laughs> but perhaps I've already had too much to drink because I joined in on the second course. Oh, dead for sure, oh, dead for sure, you're not a general anymore. A tourist guide at the Pentagon. Oh, it's sad, your star is gone. Oh, dead for sure, oh, dead for sure, you're not a general anymore. In point of fact, General Desisser was rewarded for Operation Attleboro was the nation's second highest medal, the Distinguished Service Cross. He was promoted to Major General and then quietly shipped stateside to a cushy desk job. One, two, three. One, two, three. Our second reunion, two years after the first. Hey, we can't wait another 30 years, right? <laughs> hey, you see that tall guy in the black cowboy hat? That is Major Simpson hosting here in his hometown of San Antonio. And Chino is here. Oh my God, you can hardly walk. A bunch of us cluster around Gino. I am uh, so happy to be here to, tonight. And I'm so sorry I could not make the first of you. A specialist Cairo, so happy to see you here tonight. But Gino just turns his head. The rest of us look at the floor. And finally, Major Simpson stares at Muttface, and he retreats to the bar. A little later, Gino and I have a chance to catch up. A day, one a divorce each. A one a new wife each. We are tied. <laughs> Well, yeah, but I got two kids and you don't got any. Ah, lucky for the kids you have. And uh, lucky for the kids I do not have. <laughs> what? We all know Gino has suffered from some PTSD, but uh, Gino, come on. A mud to face, a drink and a drink. For two uh, hours. Gino, didn't you hear? Mudface's son lost an arm in a tank accident six months ago at Fort Benning. 
Uh oh, here he comes. Um, Dave, uh, Gino, I want to apologize for the way I treated you guys in Vietnam. What? It took you 32 fucking years to say that? <laughs> but what I actually said was, uh, oh yeah, well, okay, uh, you know, thank you, uh, Captain Mantis. Uh, a day. How about if it's just um, a day and a Joe from now on? But Gino once again has his head turned. Uh, Dave, maybe we can talk a little later. And Muttface again retreats to the bar. Gino. What's going on? The motherfucker never once came to see me in the hospital. Not the one fucking a time. And later that night, Gino grabs the toast from Major Simpson. Excuse me. Excuse -a me. Even a two week ago, the VA a fucking with my uh, disability. You say you have a PTSD. They say you a faker. They lied to us in <coughs> Vietnam. And when we come home, our own people practically spit upon us. But um, I love uh, all of you guys. Even the assholes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> this is my all time favorite song, guys. You gotta watch this. Ready? Kids and bristle are shot at pistol when I do. The mic may stop. Reading something, joining something when I do. The mic may stop. I am at the Las Vegas bar in downtown Bangkok. Five days here. Nine days back in Coochie, and I'm gone home. And this place, it's incredible. The music! It's bullying! The lights! They're bullying! The girls! Pulsation sensation. Gino always said, the gals in a Bangkok, they have the tits the size of a Cleveland. <laughs> including the suburbs. <laughs> and um, see this gal here? That's Kimmy. She's my girlfriend. 11 bucks a night. $55 for five nights with Kimmy. I can have sex anytime I want. Day, night, 3.27 a.m. Hey, my mom always said, hey, don't have sex till you get married. But I like what they're preaching in Berkeley, make love, not war. And uh, Kimmy and I, we're going to be making love. Right? Meanwhile, back at Coochie, my buddies are playing poker. Well, specialist fishing, looks like it's time for you to start reading some books on how to play poker. Gino, I don't need this. A fish. Maybe you're lucky a night. A Clyde in a Bangkok. He always a win. A stay. Well, specialist fishing. How about if I sell you 10 bucks of my chips for five bucks? Well, okay. Oh, well, Spacious Fisher, 
Looks like you've lost that 10 bucks in another five minutes. How about if I sell you 20 bucks of my chips for three bucks? A fish, no. A fish, a don't to go. Fish. It's 1.30 a.m. the same evening, and Gino's been down at the mess hall negotiating for hamburgers and chicken for tomorrow night's barbecue. He runs into Doug on the way back to the tent. Gino, you couldn't get any steaks. A Doug, a asshole, a chef, a Henry, only trade a steak for a dead VC a photo. All I have is a pussy shot. Gino enters our tent. A few minutes later, Fish stumbles in. Gino, <laughs> I'm drunk. <laughs> And he collapses in his cot. Good night to sweet to prince. Gino looks down the row of mosquito nets. All have gone to the Sandman. Gino relishes the silence. Then he looks at my empty cot. I bet uh, Klein be uh, fucking his uh, ass off uh, right to now. <laughs> well, I'm back in my room in, in Bangkok and uh, really isn't gone the way I had hoped. Kimmy says, uh, we go restaurant, eat, eat, it's 1 a.m. By the time we finally get back to my room an hour later, She's ordered half of everything on the menu, which of course I have to pay for. She's got a couple of bundles of food, which she's probably just going to give to her family. And uh, well now she's sitting on the bed pulling pictures out of her purse. Uh, you know, I really don't want to be looking at family photos at this particular moment. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Well, <laughs> well, this first picture is of a black guy in the jungle with an M16. <laughs> Dear Kimmy, I love you too much, Charlie. This guy looks Mexican. <laughs> Kimmy, I will come back to Bangkok and take you home to Mikasa in San Jose. Ricardo. <laughs> what? Well, this guy's name is John, and he writes, Kimmy, thanks for the great week. I'll try to look you up again if my company sends me back to Bangkok. This guy looks 15 to 20 years older than my dad. Um, uh, Kimmy, uh, my friends say Thai girl number one in world made GI very happy. Please? And so Kimmy and I finally make love, but she just lies there, doesn't say a word, and stares at the ceiling. See, I don't get it. It's like she's treating this whole thing like it's a job or something. <laughs> I know. I sound like a big jerk, but back then we were just 20 year old kids coming out of the jungle for a few hours of sun. And none of us knew if we were even going to get to go home. It's 5.30 a.m. the next morning back at Coochie and Gino feels like he's been asleep for a long time when he hears the words, Let's go Gino! Gino pops out of his bunk. They're incoming! They're incoming! Gino rips through the mosquito netting and he cuts his leg on the way out. Nine young men, half naked, half asleep, stumble into this bunker. Helter Skelter. Gino takes the corner position. Then our new artist, Joe Kramer. Then David Fisher. Then Jimmy Edwards, who's designated to replace me as the chief editor. Gino mumbles under his breath. The bastards! They're walking them this way! Why don't they get them? Where are the fucking choppers? Joe Kramer, my God, they're coming close. David Fisher, Jimmy, 
Let's get in that Jeep and get the fuck out of here. Gino hears a thunderous roar to his rear and his right. He sees a glow like when you look at the sun with your eyes closed. He feels his naked body being sprayed by pebbles. He feels his body being lifted into the air and he thinks an explosion has gone off nearby and then he realizes I am right in the explosion. And then his mind starts to form the thought, I am still alive. I am still alive. Gino's stomach is open. His arms and legs are mangled. Brave David Fisher has stood head and shoulders above the rest of his buddies above that bunker rim, calling the play-by-play -play when the 75 millimeter rocket hits him in the chest. Parts of David are found 150 feet away at the orderly room. Remember, I said the fish was our little brother. Three are dead, the only fatalities in our community of 15,000 and the only married men in the tent. All six others are wounded. Officially, American casualties are light. Gino Carr was rushed to the 12th medevac. The bombs are still falling. One hits near the building, sending furniture and instruments to the ground in symphonic thunder. A frazzled nurse pumps two quarts of the wrong blood into Gino then walks away, convinced Gino will die, but nobody will notice in the fog of war. But Doug sees Gino turn gray, and he grabs the nurse. You get back there or save that soldier right now, or I will strangle you right here. While Gino is in surgery, Doug goes off to graves registration to identify the dead. He thinks. One summer, I cleaned ducks in a slaughterhouse like this. But poor Doug does not realize that he will require puzzle master skills to complete this job. You have Jimmy Edwards' head on Joe Kramer's body. The right leg of David Fisher belongs on Joe. <coughs> Gino Caro comes out of surgery and from his hospital bed he sees that the wolfhounds have brought in two wounded enemy combatants along with their 75 millimeter recoilless rifle. A dog. I watch it the wolfhounds, a cuss and a kick the VSC for an hour. And they a twitch and a moan on the floor, and they finally a die. There is a part of me that to feel a sorry for the VSC, and another part of me enraged. I can no get off of my bed to help the wolfhounds and kick the motherfuckers to death. You remember when I said that you and you and you were protecting us? Do you remember when I said that this bunker didn't even need a top? Well, Mike Wallace came out the next day to ask about the bunkers without tops. That's right, Mike Wallace, no BS, our 60 minutes. And Doug tells Mike, many of the bunkers in this area had tops. The Army wanted to convince visiting senators and hotshot newsmen that this area was safe, that we were winning the war, so they took those tops down. Captain Mudface tells Doug, Specialist Kimberly, if you aren't going home soon, 
I have your motherfucking ass court martial. The people of South Vietnam have fought for many long years. Thousands of them have died. And we just cannot now dishonor our word, or abandon our commitment, or leave those who believed us and who trusted us to the terror and repression and murder that would follow. This then my fellow Americans, is why we're in Vietnam. So I didn't find out about any of this stuff till I got back to Saigon four days later. And I'd been like really happy. I had a girlfriend. I was going home in nine days. I'm going to get to see my brothers and my sisters and my Duba. And then Andy Clannon told me. And at first I thought, no, it's not possible. And then my insides wanted to turn outside. Why them? Why not me? They had sweet wives and sweet children. I can't go back to Coochie. I won't go back to Coochie. <coughs> and then this cab driver tries to overcharge me. <coughs> you fucking slump my goop. They died for you. And the next morning back at Coochie. Dear Mike. Our aircraft this morning bombed Viet Cong positions one mile from our base camp. This is the same place they were bombing when I got here a year ago. I know that there are just wars, but sometimes this whole thing makes you wonder just what the hell we're doing here. This morning I visited Gino in the hospital, and he told me that when the blast hit, he saw this red glow that he thought was from the explosion, but now knows David Fisher's body disintegrating. Be home soon. Can't wait to see you. later and my airplane has just left Saigon. <clears throat> And so I move into the Haight-Ashbury during the Summer of Love. And on October 12, 1967, I march from Golden Gate Park with, of course, my stinky, long-haired buddy, Mike Duke, <laughs> to the steps of San Francisco City Hall, chanting all the way, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids you killed today? Hey, hey, LBJ. And then I'm standing before 15,000 people. And there's General Hugh Hester. This guy has medals not just from World War II, but World War I. And he tells the crowd the war is illegal, immoral, and genocidal. And there's Pete Seeger strumming. We're waist deep in the big muddy, but the big fool says to push on.
And then they call on me. And am I ever ready? Start rolling, boys. I spent one year in Vietnam as an Army combat correspondent. And I represent the thousands of Vietnam veterans against this war. The American people can't say that we don't know what we're talking about, that we didn't go, that we are cowards. We went, we saw, and we say this war is wrong. Just before I left, three of my closest buddies were killed in a rocket attack. And when Steve Burns... Burns stumbled out of that bunker Dave, with blood on him, parts of his friends on him, he claps into the arms of Larry Craig. And he mumbled to Larry Craig, he didn't mumble those bastard Viet Cong. He didn't mumble those bastard communists. He didn't mumble those slow-eyed bastards. He mumbled only one thing over and over. That bastard Johnson. That bastard Johnson. So, when I look at that, it's like hard for me to believe that almost 50 years have passed since I gave that speech. And I can promise you that under that hat, I actually had a head of hair back then. <laughs> and it's interesting, because over the 50 years, there's been occasions where people have asked me, well, what is war like? And I've always told them, war's like everything else in life. Just much, much, much more intense. So, uh, that's probably the reason why our group of people have stayed together, most of us, during that period of time. There, in all, there have been a total of six reunions. And even today, there's a core group of people that still communicate on the internet to the tune of about 4,000 emails a year. So I'm kind of interested because I've been asking, you know, at the end of the show each time, by a show of hands, how many people came of age during that period? Yeah, most of you. And how many Vietnam veterans are in the audience? One. Wow. And that's the way it's been pretty much. And how many people here protested the war? Yes. Yes, and it's been that way too. So give yourselves a little round of applause. <laughs> and I have a few more acknowledgments, important acknowledgments. Here's Bob Hope and Coochie on Christmas Eve, 1966, with me and Gino somewhere around here watching. Bob Hope did this for American soldiers for 50 years, from 1941 to the first Gulf War in 1991, when he was two years shy of 90. Here is Mike Wallace at Coochie reporting the day after the blast with three of my buddies behind him. Mike Wallace reported that three Army journalists had died, and I officially found out this January from no less the current executive director of 60 Minutes who had seen this clip, and he said nothing about the bunkers. And here is the real person who became the character of Gino Caro in this piece, standing on top of our bunker about three feet away from where the rocket would hit. And obviously, the bunker has no top. In the end, this piece, of course, is dedicated to the 58,282 people whose names grace the Vietnam Wall in our nation's capital, and especially to these three men. Joe Kramer came to Vietnam as an infantryman. One day out in Boloi Woods, he killed three Viet Cong, 
and he later found out that his wife gave birth to their second child on the same day. So he used his artistic talents to come up and become one of us, thinking, of course, that it would be safe. Jimmy Edwards married this sweet gal from a small town in Texas just before he shipped out. They hardly knew each other. He brought his Janet to Hawaii on R&R, &R, and she said, Hawaii, wow. She cried on his shoulder. Jimmy loved Janet so much that he wrote her every single night for eight straight months and had their wedding picture by his bunk to the morning he died. David Fisher. Fish. You have a sweet wife and two small boys at home that love you. Good night, sweet the prince.